All right, special treat tonight on Ship Chasing. It's, of course, Rotoviz's Sean Siegel swinging by to give us some of his thoughts pre-NFL draft on all of these rookie prospects. We've been talking about them through the best ball lens, through the dynasty lens, and now it is time to get Sean's thoughts. This is Ship Chasing. Let's do it. Pat Fryer Helmo. <laughs> This is why I'm hot. Anita Hanjab. Fix your sight. Jamar. <laughs> Alpha play chase. <laughs> Are you <laughs> kidding me? Can <laughs> you story? You can't handle the heat. See, it looks like we're finally this boy. You're right. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, where's my overlay? What am I doing here with this screen? Getting used to our new setup around here. Got some fresh overlays for us. We got Pat. We got Sean. Uh, Sean, welcome to the show, man. It's been a while. It has. I was thinking back to the last time, and we drafted a pretty awesome main event team, and then J.K. Dobbins immediately goes down. We just missed the tournament in a couple of ways, and then it looked like we were going to win the consolation, which would have been kind of rough since that's not the one you want to win. But yeah. final week also didn't go that well, but I liked our team. I, pretty fun things happen when I draft with the two of you. I know, and, and you and I, uh, with our Best Ball Breakfast streams, well, I drafted with both of you guys on Best Ball Breakfast. Uh, Sean, you and I had a team that had a T. Higgins, George Pickens squad that I thought was about to make some noise. It was one of those rosters, kind of like the one I had with Eric Prime for a few years back, where every player was unique. Like, it was a low advance rate team, and I was like, holy cow, can we sneak this one into the finals? It wasn't meant to be, but we will, uh, we'll be running it back this year, trying to build some of these monster teams uh Karain, i know you just dropped your article about marvin harrison today how are you doing here final show before your paternity leave yeah um no i just dropped uh, as you mentioned the article on harrison neighbors uh adunze and brian thomas so kind of the tier it's an interesting class where i actually put each of them in their own tier um and talked about why not only was i tempted to have neighbors in the same tier as harrison i mean part of me wants to just say neighbors number one baby let's go but you know i think the i talk a, a lot about the safety that harrison provides in the article and that just being worth a ton and how i think we've kind of the two guys that really come to mind are, are garrett wilson and justin jefferson where we're like yeah he's safe and he's gonna hit but like i want to chase upside it's like actually that's when those guys hit they can hit really hard so <laughs> so just bet on them Sean, I know you've been having some of these dirty thoughts as well about potentially moving neighbors ahead of uh, Harrison. Well, it, it seemed like there was a Garrett Wilson mention there. I think I have 100% shares, but has he hit yet? I mean, well, you know, in the dynasty sense, I would you'd have to say yes. Like he's been vaulted into the the kind of the soon to be elite kind of tiers of of value, which I think yeah, from best ball, it's been just that one amazing year where his price is a ninth round pick and we all profited. But, um, you know, I think, you know, he, he what is he's like the 11th overall pick in, in underdog drafts right now. So, you know, I, the, the safety element also sometimes comes with like a market based element where if you want to get out on Garrett Wilson now, Sean, you're you're not you're not you're going to have plenty of takers. Well, if I keep drafting him at six, maybe I can. Move him up. <laughs> How much, how much, Sean, do you think the – and I know you uh, do a really good job of kind of not getting caught up in, in groupthink and the hive mind, but it does seem like, you know, Neighbors has this incredible pro day, and I think a lot of his just insane athleticism is also fueling this excitement and not taking away from what he's done on the field just as a prospect with his production. But I do wonder, like, if Harrison did a pro day where he blazed at the 40 and stuff, like – would that sentiment not quite be there? If everyone's like, no, 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 yeah, it's still Harrison because he's all this and athletic. Like, I'm just wondering how much of that has been fueled by Harrison being out of sight, out of mind. Well, people who know a lot more about college football than I do, you know, report that the on-field tracking numbers for Harrison make it, you know, pretty clear cut that he is also a big-time, big-time athlete. And we know that he's gotten over the top of defenses, you know, more or less at will, drawing a lot of targets that you know, if you don't have that athleticism, it's going to be more difficult to draw. So I don't think there's any question about the athleticism of either guy other than for me, when you see what neighbors did and then you know that he's immediately going to be you know, maybe the most athletic guy on every field when you put all of it together. I mean, I think there's actually a really good evidence-based case 
the neighbor should be number one. And I think that they, I mean, one of the great things, if you missed the playoffs last year and you have a pick in the top six, is that I think there are six guys where a year from now, any of them we could look at as being the 101 or like the, the best player, the number one guy, and maybe even by a significant margin. And so, I mean, that's a huge gift to people who you know don't have the 101, who didn't tank all the way down to having no players and scoring no points, right? But with that being said, I mean, I think that you could put neighbors at one and put some QBs in there, put Brock Bowers in there and have Harrison below those guys. And I'll probably be wrong, but I, I think you could actually put a little bit of a gap even between these two players. So I, I don't think it's just the athleticism, but the athleticism certainly doesn't hurt. The other spicy part of what you just said, and obviously I, I actually want to unpack your, your Brock stuff, how much that pertains to only tight end premium. I know that's like what you do the ranks for, but uh, I believe that means Rome is the odd man out because a lot of people would have him as the top six and then like Daniels. Bowers as the seventh guy or, or Daniels. No, for me, it is going to be a Dunze and it's not that I don't like him. I think there are some people out there who don't care for him because there are certain red flags. That isn't the case for me. I'm going to make the case that he's actually also very, very good, but no, he would be sort of in that next year. And, and on the Brock stuff, uh, I know I realize we're jumping around a good bit here, but is that um, exclusive for tight end premium uh, or if people were that are in just like regular super flex leagues, where would you have Bowers in that seven range? Well, yeah, I think that it, I mean, he's going to move to the back of the tier if it's not tight end premium. Yeah. Uh, I encourage people to play tight end premium. I more yeah. or less only play that now with the RV triflex leagues at the FFPC and just, I mean, it's fun when the tight ends score a lot of points and you need to have that scoring. But I, he's such an amazing... And the other thing is I like tight ends. So I draft them, you know, religiously in the second round. Almost all of my teams have both Laporta and McBride, not just because I was excited about those guys. And man, it took a long time for McBride to hit him. I mean, yeah. We got to the point where I was on the verge of cutting him in some leagues. And certainly if he was cut, you know, you jumped in there and spent a lot. But I think that... A, you want to have that huge advantage at tight end because even though it, I mean, it does look a lot deeper, but if you can gap your all of your opponents by five, six points in that tight end premium, I think that you want to do that. It's just, it's such a massive advantage. And then you mentioned, you know, in the premium, if you have a lot of flex spots, I mean, they're very viable plays there as well. I mean, certainly if you have both Laporta and McBride, you're going to start both of them in most of your leagues, unless you have some incredible juggernaut or, you know, unless maybe McBride falls. I mean, McBride has the higher ceiling, probably also the lower floor. Yep. Um, Pat, do you have in, in yours, do you have Bauer? Do you have Rome ahead of Bowers? I don't. I have, I have Bowers ahead of Rome. Um, yeah. And I came away really liking Roma Dunze. Um, and I had him in a tier, you know, like I said, they're all in their own tier. So he's a tier above Brian Thomas. Um. I would say the gap between neighbors and Rome, though, and you can see this in my uh, dynasty rankings on on leg up. It, it's quite a bit bigger than the gap between Harrison and neighbors. the The tear break there, I think, just signifies that I'm just I'm not really thinking about neighbors. Maybe I'd consider trading down, but if I have the chance to take Harrison or neighbors, I'm probably just taking Harrison um, and making the bet that I think is safer with plenty of upside. But neighbors would be the wide receiver one in most classes. He's an awesome, awesome prospect. I think Odunze is a very good prospect. Um, but you look at Bowers, I mean, he's one of the best tight end prospects that we've got. So, uh, you know, I he's not like perfect. He's a little undersized. Um, we, we don't know if we have elite athleticism, right? So that's that's like where the, the a little bit of worry comes in, but just the immediate production uh, at Georgia, you know, it's, it's like, it's pretty, it's pretty bulletproof. So I'm, I'm very excited about Bowers. He's also a good run blocker despite being a little undersized. So I think he's going to be out there on play action stuff, kind of playing traditional tight end gets comp to George Kittle a lot. And so, you know, it's kind of a, you know, really young version of, of the Kittle archetype. That's very exciting in tight end premium. I, I would probably have Rome ahead in not non-tight end premium. 
are you as aggressive with Bowers in redraft, Sean, or is this more kind of a long play here? No, I think that he's ready to go out there and and put up the points. And so I'm trying to get two of the elite tight ends in most of my drafts. And to do that, he definitely has to be one of those guys and he has to be one of the people you're actually targeting because it's a little bit trickier if you know we're getting a lot of the most expensive players. And obviously Laporta is the guy that you would want the most. And yet at the same time, there are so many weapons in that Detroit offense that I do think that there is some you know volume risk just as you split it up. And then obviously when you're taking Laporta, you've got to bypass players at other positions who are just so much better than even when you drop a couple of rounds. And so when you're looking at Kincaid, Bowers, uh, Kyle Pitts now, hopefully, I mean, those are the guys that I think you've got to have just a lot of exposure to. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've talked about this with Pat the other day, and I know Pat feels similarly. I mean, the what are your thoughts on some of the prices on these tight ends in redraft where you have guys like Trey McBride, Mark Andrews, even Travis Kelsey, sometimes falling all the way to the fifth round. And then all those tight ends you just mentioned, you know, available in the sixth as well. And this is where we kind of get into that element of trying to figure out the tactics for a given season, because last year it felt so clear cut that you wanted to have Laporta and McBride. And the fact that they were going to be available at prices that let you do a lot of other things early was fantastic right i think that the tight ends are so good in those top couple of tiers and the prices are so relatively favorable and then at least at this point right we could have a lot that's still going to happen before we're like really heavily drafting in august but right now i don't have the same belief in the upside of the later tight ends and certainly i go and look at uh you know, my results from 2023, but this extends to other years as well. When you look at your teams and the teams that have tight end scoring, you know, are overwhelmingly the teams that are doing well. And some years that meant elite tight end last year, it didn't necessarily, but it did mean you had to have guys with some upside. And so I'm still trying to make sure I accomplish that with the prices you just mentioned. I think you can do it. I think you want two of them. I mean, this for me is a season that is so fun because it's going to be so clear cut zero rb right it's the, pretty clear cut yeah i mean the running backs that you really want are expensive which wasn't necessarily the case last year and in, in a year when you have the scoring that you got from Mostert and kyron williams it's going to create some weird dynamics in terms of looking back on the season saying well this this worked it's like well <laughs> you had two running backs deep score that many points and obviously that worked that's not going to be the case every time when we were making the case for zero RB between like 2013 and, you know, 2021, for example, I mean, it worked very, very well without, you know, those kinds of results. But when you look at the situation right now, one of the things in the past couple of years, I thought that there were some really exciting backs in that three through seven round range. I guess I don't feel that way this year. I think it's, you know, one and two. And then once you get deeper, well, at one and two, you still have other guys you need. And then once you get deeper, you just, you take those guys. But without having the names in three through seven, and then I like the wide receivers in three through seven a lot more than I did a year ago. So for me, it, it makes this season so fun, such clear cut zero RB, and then allowing you also to put the tight ends in there. The rosters I'm drafting this year, at least for me personally, are very exciting. There's a level of comfort, there's a level of enjoyment. And you look at those names and you're like, I don't know if I'm going to win, but this is a fun team. <laughs> Are you into uh, a couple of the guys, the running backs and kind of the early, I mean, Devin Achan is going in the top two rounds, but uh, he's kind of a difficult one because I think we all understand he's not going to be like a true workhorse, but you know, he was a one B last year, but he was in a, he was a rookie and he was incredibly efficient. You're hoping he stays a little bit healthier, um, but he's not the classic archetype. He's going right next to the classic archetypes in Saquon Barkley and, and Jonathan Taylor, who tend to go in the second round. What where are you at on him? Yeah, I I don't know that it's a ironclad rule, but one of the rules I always had with zero RB is that when you hit on a guy and you love him, you can't chase him into round one and two the next year. It just doesn't work, right? The odds, the risks, the rewards are not distributed in such a way that you can just chase the guys that you had success with the previous year. Now, the sad thing with Achan is that we didn't really have the success because he missed all of those games. And that part was heartbreaking. Yeah. I mean, if you're not guaranteed to be the top scorer on your team, 
second round is is tough. I mean, I, I still draft him occasionally, and I think the argument for him being there because you could certainly see it evolving to, you know, him being Jamal Charles. And I mean, in that offense, the number of big plays you could get, even with another back. I just think you have to balance those things too and not just get so excited and think, I mean, this guy is the coolest back in the coolest offense. I'm going to draft him whatever his price is. There's a little bit of a, a point in mid round two for me as well, where it goes from, you have to draft these wide receivers to you don't necessarily. And there's, there's a little bit of a dead spot. If you get him sliding into the dead spot, then yeah, I mean, every once in a while, but it's, it's tough. It's, it's hard to chase him up there. Well, I'm doing it. Uh <laughs> What about what about James Cook? Uh, he's I think I'm another guy I'm higher on than you, but I mean this isn't this the guy that we're normally supposed to be excited about? I mean he hasn't gotten chased up uh, or or put up into you know the early early rounds. He's like a fourth fifth round type of pick, and he was very explosive. He catches passes. He's in an elite offense. They threw to him more at the end of the season. Went under a new offensive coordinator who's still in place, um, and. You know he's he wasn't a great prospect, but but pretty solid. They'll probably draft someone for competition, but it's not a particularly strong running back class, so that competition could end up being fairly weak. So he kind of reminds me a little bit of ETN as sort of a you know like a um, like probably probably not going to be a true workhorse. I think even more so for Cook than than for ETN, but it feels like he has a couple different paths where he can be really a really explosive rusher but he also adds enough as in the receiving game or just the offense kind of puts him on its back and there's just a lot of points to be had well cook was one of my very favorite players and biggest targets a year ago and all of those things that you just mentioned were reasons why but again for me it's a it's a element of once he gets up into the price that's just a little bit higher than I'd prefer just to take the receivers. And I think the build works a lot better for me with the receivers. And one of the things is I made what I thought was an extremely compelling case to have a huge amount of James Cook last year. And there were all of these bright spots. And then you're watching the games and he's dropping touchdowns, mm -hmm. another drop touchdown, another drop touchdown. They're about to seal the game and he fumbles. And I always tell people, you know, try and not get caught up in these, devastating plays that are so high profile the guy's obviously very good he's obviously the way that they need to play to win but you think back to what the bills did last year where you know josh allen makes some mistakes and all of a sudden they get conservative they win some games they feel like that that was in some ways successful they have an approach for the playoffs against the chiefs that you know <laughs> it's not going to let you beat the chiefs that often and i guess i would be concerned that if you have a player who, as you mentioned, wasn't a great prospect and probably is not, for me, not to the level of an ETN, and then he has the risk of making these mistakes. That yeah, I, I think ETN was a much stronger for. prospect. Yeah. I feel like it is a unique year to head into or think about backfields, whether through dynasty or best ball, you know, before and after the NFL draft, because, you know, we've had ingrained in our heads. Like I always have the phrase bombs go off in these backfields, right? And, teams that you don't think are going to draft running backs do and you look at all these fragile adps but then to your point it's like we have a weak running back class um there's only a couple of spots for really clean landing spots and then even then like there's not even a ton of fragile running back adps i think you could point to that fourth fifth round with like pacheco and rashad white and james cook um i think those could be some too but do you feel like we're going to get a ton of shakeup to the running back board through the draft, or do we just not have the firepower to make it happen? I still think that we will. And I mean, there are a couple of spots that seem so good that I think those guys, you know, who land there will really rise. The, I mean, someone like a Jalen Warren seems like he's going to be permanently mispriced. And I mean, there are some starters who also, if they get over their injury concerns are going to be very good in that same range. I mean, someone like Charbonnet, I thought was a really tricky bet last year. And even though he didn't go off, I actually like him more for this season. And, and now the price on him is, is really, really good. And so, I mean, there, you can load up, you can load up. I mean, there, there are options as we get deeper into it. I don't know that it's going to come as a result of huge price shifts, 
but I really like a lot of the talents that we get later in these drafts. Yeah. With Warren, I'm trying to uh, make sure that I take more than enough so that I don't chase him up into the second round next year. Well, you just always want to make sure you mention too, that Nashi Harris had a lot of very interesting stats last year. Don't forget about him. Keep drafting. him. <laughs> Can you just name, name one of those, please Sean? I mean, he, he breaks some tackles. He does. He sure does. He breaks the uh, tackles. It, I mean, you watch him. He's not actually running the opposite direction after he breaks the tackles, but the yardage numbers would suggest that he does. I, I feel like for the rookie running back spots, obviously everyone has penciled or circled, you know, Cowboys and Chargers. Are there any running backs that almost, I don't want to say completely separated from landing spot, but that you think you're going to be excited about? no matter what, even if they don't have a, a clear runway to a ton of touches right away? Well, I think that both Jonathan Brooks and Trey Benson, when you look at the situations, there is some potential there. And if you have the ability to create some big plays and the ability to have the right type of workload, and you look at Benson, I mean, one of the things with him that's so somewhat strange, the 2022 season, his peripherals are fantastic, 2023, maybe not so much. But the receiving numbers on a per play basis are really exciting. And then you're thinking, you know, you know that actually what you want to look for in the prospect is someone with a lot of receptions as opposed to, you know, very efficient when you get the receptions. But if you have a back where that could become more a part of what they do, then that would be exciting. You have the testing for him, which, I mean, the Adrian Peterson athletic comp that shows up in our workout explorer, I don't think that you're necessarily taking that that seriously. But, you know, if you have a name like, um, Orion Matthews, some guy like a DeMarco Murray. I think that you could, you could certainly see that type of reality in the future for them. And then there are a lot of guys who actually have pretty good peripherals, especially for the final season, which is an element I think in this class, maybe more than in some classes you you've got to look at and hope that that means something because the overall production for players isn't necessarily there, but if you have good peripherals for Marshawn Lloyd, if you have good peripherals for Jalen Wright, and they were able to take another step at the NFL level. I mean, Marshawn Lloyd has a lot of really cool things in his profile, and then you just, why does he not carry the ball more? The thing, though, when we're looking at price and we're looking at how a lot of the NFL backfields work, I mean, probably there aren't that many situations in which teams really want a guy to take that many touches. Anyway, if you can go out there and be dynamic with your touches, you can be, you know, create those big plays, create the type of broken tackles and force missed tackles that we know have a predictive element. We know that the coaches really like because you do something that catches the coach's eye. I mean, the broken tackle element, so much of that, and you think about, you know, Najee Harris being drafted originally, keeping his job, all those kinds of things. I mean, there are a lot of football people who are going to be more excited the, about the broken tackle than gaining the yards. And so if you have some good peripherals for those guys, I think that, I mean, the I think both the floor and the ceiling is better maybe than people are giving credit for. And then as I look at the backs going all the way down through, I find myself thinking, okay, I mean, the overall argument isn't really here. But and just you need more production. One of the things that was interesting when Dave Cabin's breakaway rush scores came out was that basically all the guys at the top are small school guys. And I mean, that's obviously a pretty big red flag in a variety of ways. It shows that and the way that he does the breakaway rush scores, I think is really interesting and really valuable because it has both sort of a volume and, you know, just you got to create these big plays sort of element to it. And, and together it gives you a good sense of you know, who is going to be able to go out there and consistently create these plays? Well, I mean, we just don't see it in this class. And yet when you look at the reasons for different players and you look at, you know, what they could bring, are there a lot of names who have a specific type of role that they could perform at the level? I think that there are. And so for me, I do think that the guys who are right now sort of in that 17, 18, 19, 20, and then maybe like if you were to draft out 21, 22 would start to be picked and right now you just don't have enough information to say, I want to burn a pick on them. I think we're going to have guys from that range kind of pull in and be drafted. And I mean, that, that part will be fun. And certainly, you know, if Kyron Williams has shown us anything, it's that, you know, we're going to get some names where prior to that emergence, you wouldn't have necessarily thought that profile would have worked. I think some of the deep yeah. guys, and certainly you're not going to have that all the time, but 
I think that we're going to have somebody come out of nowhere and score points from this class, if not this year, then the, in the following year. So again, from a dynasty perspective, when you're looking at fourth round picks, you know, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, I think that's right. It's just going to be really hard to predict some of these later guys. Um, and I, I mean, but I also think like the NFL landscape, I think is probably, there's a lot of backs that are kind of aging out right now like there's not a lot of running backs as as i kind of run look at the numbers on stuff that really jump out as like true difference makers in the in the league right now as we've got some of these really big names that are on the back end of their career we've had you know a couple decent running back classes but nothing that's like really revived things the way you know a few years ago so i i i tend to agree that the nfl is moving away from kind of the the workhorse back stuff but we we see all the time. It's like, oh, this coach always uses a committee, and then you give him an elite running back, and it's like, oh no, I guess he, does. I guess he doesn't. So I think so. It is a talent-driven position in some ways, um, and so in, you know, in a way, if there's not that much, if there's not like an overwhelming amount of talent in these starting jobs, it creates opening. So I'm trying to be open-minded with some of the names a little bit further down in this running back class, but it is tough. I mean. There's a lot of red flags for so many of these running. Actually, as I was writing the guys up, um, and I, this is probably the next article I have out is the the my second part of the running backs. And one guy I actually came away liking a little bit more than I thought was Bucky Irving, um, just because his the athleticism is atrocious and it's very much kind of a Kyron Williams type of play, which has basically never worked except Kyron Williams. Um, but like he can do kind of everything okay and you're like all right if you just weren't 192 and a horrible athlete we'd be we'd have something here <laughs> it's like well maybe he gains what maybe what if he gains weight and then he's a 200 pound bad athlete now we could you know <laughs> but that's kind of like though that's one of the guys i feel kind of good about and it's probably more of a two-year play he gets in a he gets in a program he puts on a little weight that kind of thing but I have, I've definitely had trouble, even with Marshawn Lloyd. I've, I've had a lot of trouble mustering that much enthusiasm for him. Uh, it just seems very, very boom bust. Braylon Allen seems super boom bust. Are there any like of that kind of beyond Brooks and Benson? Are there are there guys that jump out to you as like, you know, especially appealing? Or are you kind of waiting for the draft capital and the landing spots to kind of lead us, point us in the right direction? Yeah, I think. I mean, obviously, with these runners, we're going to need the landing spots, but. Allen's freshman season, I think, offers the potential that he is actually a guy that coaches will play more than maybe anybody wants. And I think he'll be a little better than people think. And so you're going to end up potentially having a lot of touches, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with that. I agree with that, yeah. That part of it could be interesting. Then, you know, you have someone in quorum where the 2022 peripherals were excellent. The 2023 peripherals, even with, you know, the touchdowns and all that were absolutely terrible. But then he has, you know, an elite evasion rate. I mean, sorry, an elite agility score, which, right. you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, well, what if he catches some passes at the mm-hmm. NFL level? And even if he's not someone who's actually very dynamic. He's not going to run to daylight. You know, maybe you could get like a goal line and receiving type of role. There are a variety of guys here where, you know, you're probably not going to look to them to get 1500 yards, but if they could get the right high value touch mix, I think it would be interesting. And Will Shipley is somebody who maybe isn't getting nearly as much credit or coverage, probably because Debbie managers who have him like me are just devastated. But again, it's kind of the thing where if you go back to the freshman year and then you look at the total number of receptions over the last couple of years, I actually think that he, his price doesn't make any sense. I mean, he'll probably bust, but I mean, you should at the price that he's at, you should have a decent number of shares because there's actually a pretty decent little argument for him. I mean, he's somebody I could actually see blowing up which I don't think is necessarily the case for other guys. And so if he's basically free and he has a really high upside, even though the, you know, the bus factor is through the roof too. I mean, at those prices, he's somebody, maybe it's just that it's fun. And so at that yeah. price, I draft him in every draft, which, you know, there are some strengths and weaknesses to that. I mean, Gorendo's a guy where mm-hmm. he's runs like, he doesn't run like a back that that's, is that size. But if you simply look at it as athleticism and then maybe a little bit of a receiving deal, then 
you know, there's some interest there. So the fact that he doesn't run like a 220 pound back that has that athleticism, is certainly a, a huge red flag. It makes him more of a, a niche type of player as opposed to someone who's going to be David Johnson, but in the right role with, you know, the comma he's put up. I mean, there's some interest there. I mean, Tyrone Tracy, you know, you and I were joking on OT is super old and yet his actual final season i think is is one of the better ones certainly from a balance perspective and from a peripherals perspective and then you get the the testing and you're like oh well he's actually athletic enough to to potentially do these things so you can keep going down through i mean you pointed out to me the estimate with the you know better pro day and then some of his you know the jumps were actually quite good and Mm -hmm. he's got some some decent numbers if he's drafted earlier than people think and he probably will, because I think that probably the NFL is not as fixated with, <laughs> with that four seven time at the combine as when I mean, you see four seven, you're like, well, I mean, you're just, it's everything is done now. But he probably gets drafted a little bit earlier and maybe into an interesting role. We talked about Ray Davis on OT, how that could be kind of a sneaky, high value touch kind of situation. And then you go down into some of these guys like Lauby, who, you know, they're I'm hoping you're going to say Dylan. Here Luke. we go. So you've got then a lot of, I mean, you can have a lot of receptions there, right? And we've kind of lost some of these backs who you can draft in the end of your draft and just get receptions from. And I mean, I think that he's going to going to deliver that. So if we look at specific types of ways that they could score points for us, as opposed to being like well-rounded, strong NFL players, I think that the class becomes more interesting. Do you have much hope for Ray Davis? I mean, I thought that your case for him was was more or less perfect. I think that he's somebody who probably will appeal to the certain type of coach, and you hope that that's the coach who actually drafts him. I mean, sometimes you get the draft, and then it's very clear that the people who drafted him didn't believe in the thesis. And then you know, <laughs> that's always disappointing. But, yeah, I mean, I think that he can move into some touches that work, but you're going to have to really follow the depth chart with him. I think he's yeah, yeah. somebody who, you know, it's an in-season kind of play. How do you think about it, this from kind of like a macro perspective and how much we should be discounting this class? Because one thing, you know, when I'm doing these early big board drafts and you can get any one of these rookie running backs after pick 100 and you can go look at historical Rotoviz tools and there's the chart. It shows like the sweet spot for drafting these rookies and in, in zero RB builds. And this is like hitting us squarely where all of these guys are going. But that could also be applied to better and stronger classes a lot of the time as well. And so I'm just having, I've been loading up specifically on Brooks and Benson a ton. um, But just wondering like how much of that should be adjusted for this unique year or how much should we be taking advantage of these really cheap prices, at least before the draft? I think we should probably be taking advantage. It's hard to say for sure. But when you look at some of the aggressive prices at wide receiver, you do get the impression that people are adjusting in their minds and that the reason the prices on these backs are where they are is that they don't like them. And I think that that's exploitable, at least in a small way, probably not exploitable in a way where you're, you know, you're going to dominate all your leagues because you've done this, but I do think the prices on these guys work. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it's hard I, I to, I mean, Brooks and Benson oh, is the way to play it. That's, that's the way if you're loading up right now on two guys, I think it should be those two guys. Um, and I think Corman and Wright would be the next two guys that I, I think I'd let up, so I'm going right down the ADP list. But well, and I I did my last week. I did a video, Sean, where I was uh, doing dream landing spots for the wide receivers, and then kind of predicting what I thought their underdog ADP would be. And you know, one thing I realized is like there's not a ton of room for windfall on a lot of these guys, other than maybe someone like Xavier Worthy, who we're going to talk about here in a second. But then I did it. Uh, I did it for the running backs. Uh, not a video. I'm going to have a piece up on Fantasy Life. And, you know, Jonathan Brooks and Benson, I had jumping, you know, five rounds, basically, if they landed on the Chargers or the Cowboys into like the fifth round. But then I was looking, I did, I did Blake Corum to the Bengals um, because, you know, pretty ambiguous spot, you know, usurping Zach Moss didn't seem that daunting to me, but I still only pushed him up a couple of rounds, even in that spot, which I would consider like outside of the top two spots, like a pretty good spot. And so it did get me thinking on the non Benson Brooks guys. I'm like, are there huge potential windfalls here for landing spots? And it's, it's really hard to find them. Yeah. Well, I mean, and as you go down, I mean, even someone like Kamani vital, you have someone who, again, we're talking about a smaller school guy. And so you're going to look at the numbers very differently, but 
I mean, this is somebody who was seventh in the nation in broken tackles with 37, second in forced missed tackles with 36. I mean, the totals there are monstrous, 11 evaded tackles on his 17 receptions. And then he goes and he tests in such a way that, you know, the 44640 at 213 pounds, a 37 inch vertical. I mean, these are certainly size, speed results that will play at the NFL level. So should we take some of that production in college that seriously? Possibly not. But you put that then with the fact that, I mean, there are certainly guys that people try and sell you on all the time who are less athletic, at least than he tested. And so when you're thinking about the risk reward, the price for him, I mean, if there is an NFL team that believes in that. So I, I think that you can make those cases as you go through. Obviously, you have uh, people who are big fans of Isaiah Davis. And so I think if you sprinkle those guys in at the end, especially right now when we have more rounds, that part to me is kind of interesting. Although, again, when I pull the trigger on somebody like that that nobody else is drafting in the final round, you are also thinking, you know, people probably know something I don't or they're just not as willing to waste these picks. Any thoughts, Sean, on, on Trey Benson? Like with Trey Benson's profile, I just want to hear his name on, in round two. Uh, because it's like that committee back. And I know he's coming off a big injury, uh, like a really big injury in his freshman season. And maybe that helps explain, although I don't love the idea that it two and three years later is explaining why he's committee back to be honest, but you know, he was very athletic. So he's over the injury yet. He was still used in a, in a committee role. If you look at guys who are used, uh, it very sparingly like career backfield dominator rating, uh, in like the thirties and stuff. If you look at guys who are drafted first or second round, it's not really that concerning. Um, but if you look at guys who are drafted in the third round or the fourth round, I mean, then you're talking about kind of like your Damian Pierce's, Tevin Coleman's, Kenneth Gainwell, uh, Andre Williams. The names, uh, Deontay Foreman, who I guess what could have been maybe, but uh, Matt Jones. It's like a lot of Daryl Henderson, Trey Sermon. It's a lot of guys who you're kind of like, yeah, it makes sense why you weren't used a ton, actually, in retrospect in college. Um, and I guess I want to – I think the scouting – I want I want the NFL to really like Trey Benson. That's, like, my, to me, very important. I think it's important for, in us, like, trying to figure out who he really is as a prospect in a way where if Jonathan Brooks were to fall to the third round, like, it's probably because of the ACL tear, and that's concerning in, a, in another way. But I, I feel more confident – in who Jonathan Brooks is as a prospect than I do about Trey Benson. So I guess I'm like less concerned about the actual landing spot with Benson than some other backs and more concerned with the capital. Is that, does that kind of ring true to you at all? I think so. I mean, obviously Josh Jacobs are probably competing with much better players and, and I guess I would still kind of make the case that Josh Jacobs is a little more just a guy than maybe he's perceived to be, but certainly you get a draft pick pretty early. He's really good at being just a guy. <laughs> I mean, he was another one last year where you're like, do you know which direction the end zone is? I mean, you've got to generate some yards. But the yeah, I mean, Benson is is fast, right? And yeah, yeah. so many of his numbers are so encouraging. And then you mentioned the backfield dominator rating, and you're like, the coaches didn't feel it was necessary to put somebody like that on the field hardly at all. And so, like you're saying, you need to have that question, that story answered for you in the affirmative or else you've got to be very, I think, careful about drafting a position that you already need to be careful drafting. Yep. Yep. Let's go back to, to wide receiver. We talked a little bit about the guys at the top, but I want to talk about Xavier worthy. Uh, I know you guys have been talking about him on your Rotoviz podcast and, you know, I think consensus still the market, how the NFL has it is Brian Thomas over Xavier worthy. I am noticing more and more steam unworthy lately but uh where are you at on xavier worthy who i feel like these mock drafts have him going all over the place like i hear travis may come on your show and saying like i wouldn't be surprised if he goes as early as like 20 and then you'll see a mock draft that has him at like 63 and i'm like what 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 is going on here well when travis said that i was like i'm gonna now put him with a as opposed to worrying about putting him with brian thomas <laughs> so that's kind of the the area that I'm looking at there. Yeah. His situation and Travis also had some notes for those of us who, you know, aren't as tuned into college football about worthy playing with a damaged hand and how difficult it is to catch in that. And, you know, I don't know how much 
excuse you can really make for a player if he's out there on the field. I mean, your teammates need to be, need to be able to catch the ball if it's thrown to you. But when you think about how epic his rookie season was or his freshman season was, that for me more or less answers all the questions that you need about Worthy, especially for the small guys. I'm looking for the crazy speed, and obviously <laughs> – He's got that. There's no question there. And then I want that early breakout as opposed to being as fixated with the big final year numbers. You know, one of the things that can get lost too, I think, is that Worthy probably is a little bit more multi dimensional than people give him credit for. You have the 16 evaded tackles in that freshman season, which is going to be really good. And I'll kind of mention that again here in a moment in a different context, maybe. But then in 2022, second in the nation in air yards. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, why am I not hearing more about this? Because he didn't gain any actual yards. And the like conversion rate of those air yards was impossibly low. And so I think I that think raises... this is the season when he hurt his hand as well. I think yeah, it was so... that, that year. I mean, when you're talking, and again, different groups are going to have it charted differently, right, in all likelihood. But when you're talking about something like 1,900 plus air yards and only like 400 and some converted it's like there are some yards left on the table there so then you got to go back and ask like whose fault that is well as a freshman he demonstrated the ability to gain the yards and i don't think that completely disappears i, I think that obviously if he had more production we wouldn't even be having this conversation It'd be a very clear cut that someone with that speed and that early production would be drafted in the top 15 picks i it's hard for me to see him you know, going after that. So then in this final year, a more of a mixed bag, I think that Sanders is a lot better than maybe people are giving him credit for. I've kind of been all over the place myself on Mitchell. He's one of the ones that I've been alternatively sort of the most excited about and then the most scared of and, and going back and forth there. But I do think that he takes a lot of the value out of Worthy. And you can actually look at them on the deep throws and see that in 2023, Mitchell was much more effective there. And certainly if you're looking at a guy who has got four, two speed and you're hoping he's going to get, you know, beyond the defense for you and create those big plays, then that might be a little bit disconcerting. On the other hand, worthy last year was fourth in the nation in yards after the catch. And so, especially in the right offense, if you have a quarterback who can throw this deep ball, I guess I'm not as worried that some of the failures to convert that we saw in college are going to, could carry on to the NFL level. Certainly if you have the four, two speed, I think that a, it just is going to change the game for the opposing defense, regardless of how good you are yourself. And that has value to the NFL team, which I think gives him a very high floor in terms of where he's drafted. I can't imagine him going, you know, into the forties, fifties, sixties, although I'm wrong on that all the time. Uh, but then also once the ball's in his hands, I mean, some of the guys who are small and fast, you actually can't get on the ball very well. They don't, do anything with it when they have it. I don't think that worthy as much as much of a concern there. And again, if you got a guy who can run with it who has four two speed, your any given play could be the whole thing. We saw the Dolphins have a lot of success with these types of plays last season. So I think that the profile is a little more well rounded than the stats necessarily show. But again, I just go back to that first season and go back to the speed, and I think it's very difficult for this particular player to not work unless you get in a, a horrible, horrible situation, which. That probably still is something that Harrison and neighbors could overcome. Almost anybody else is going to have trouble with it. I, I saw this tweet just on the on the stuff here. Uh, Jacob Gibbs posted this tonight. Highest career off-target rates from the wide receiver prospects I evaluated, 22.4% for Xavier Worthy by a, a huge margin. Then you're down there, 17.9, Devontae Walker, 17.6, Ricky Pearsall, 17.9, or two, Ana Smith there. Uh, so... I, I think these guys all it's have downfield. I know, but the, the, the Dylan Lube and anus jokes have just now seeped into my brain. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I do think it's pretty Dylan worth Lube. mentioning that Worthy has not been receiving too many uh, high quality targets, which leads to a ton of air yards as well. Yeah, that's so, what, Sean, what are your feelings on how linked? he and ad mitchell are going to be and we have seen you know the teammate stuff play out where in a kind of not always but in somewhat correlated way um with you know aj brown and dk metcalf the, the lsu guys um it's like i think we saw the the counter example patterson justin hunter and Derek rogers 
<laughs> None of them turn out oh, to be geez. really anything. So I think with A.D. Mitchell, my feeling is like, man, if he's not that good and he came in here and kind of changed the way that they were deploying Xavier Worthy a little bit and took over some of that kind of classic downfield role, um, if he's not that good, that that's – that's a red flag. On the other hand, A.D. Mitchell does have a really high ceiling and could be really good, and so it's it's possible they they're both great. So, do you kind of buy that they their outcomes are are kind of correlated in a way? Yeah, definitely. And one of the things here too is that I think it might be the case that their quarterback play was mm-hmm. worse than people realize, and so that has me and obviously for reasons like what Pete just mentioned. Um, when I'm looking at Mitchell, I don't know exactly what to do with him because you know you have that first year there at Georgia where it's it. I don't know that this is necessarily that meaningful, but it's interesting to me that on a team with you know McConkey and Jermaine Burton, you have you know you ran more routes, you generated more targets, you created more air yards than those guys, and those guys are certainly on the radar. And then you look at this, and then you obviously have the injuries, and injuries when you don't have that big of a sample is going to be problematic. But then you have this season here where According to SIS, he has the best drop percentage in the country and one of the best on-target catch percentages in the country. And then you look at Sanders, and I was kind of cutting up the targets into some different kind of air yards buckets to see you know, who's succeeding underneath, who's succeeding intermediately, who's getting over the top, you know, how much flexibility these guys have, what's their game. And... Again, I don't know this is important. It's probably mostly just interesting. But Sanders had the highest yards per target in that kind of 6 to 19 air yards range like anybody in the country and above all of the elite wide receivers. And so I do think that you have teammates who will or did knock down the overall volume that he was capable of getting in 2023. Yeah, that makes sense. Sanders, I was pretty into, but he his, he tested so poorly. And it was kind of like, oh, this dude's athletic. And I was like, oh, no, it's not. So that was a bit of a bummer. But, yeah, that's true. The, the tight end, too, is involved as a pass catcher uh, factors in a little bit there. I guess with, with Brian Thomas, I ultimately had Thomas ahead. And, I mean, Thomas is a scary, scary evaluation where he, I think, could be very good. I think he could be a pretty big bust. Um, he's, it's just like, it feels very binary. Like either he's a really good downfield wide receiver or kind of bullied, not to great college competition with the defense focused on an actual elite wide receiver. And he had a Heisman winning quarterback. So it's like, which I'm, and I'm genuinely like not sure which it is. I'm trying to basically make sure, like basically tilt my exposures in the way that I think, are are going to set me up the best for you know avoiding the huge 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 downside. So I'm a little less interested in him in, in dynasty in the late first round. A little more interested in him in best ball, where I think you know he could hit the ground running, could bank a really nice landing spot. Um, but I I would say like with Thomas, he neighbors is legit, and he did have now it was all touchdown driven. But he did have a breakout true junior season playing alongside neighbors. Which and, is hard to do. Which is hard to do. And scoring 17 touchdowns when Malik Neighbors is on the field seems pretty good to me. So I I do that part of it, right? The teammate part, I at least know is a bull signal with Thomas that he he definitely had a super talented teammate. Neighbors is just such a such a strong prospect. I feel really confident much more confident neighbors than, than A.D. Mitchell. So that's that that was a little bit of it where I just feel like I, I think both these guys have some really exciting elements to their profiles, some some red flags, some things that leave me a little confused. Um, and I, I think Thomas still goes ahead in the draft. Do you think Wait Worthy has flipped him now? Yeah, I think both of those guys have the chance to go really early, which I think is a lot more of a risk for – the team drafting Thomas, although probably still does give them a little bit more upside just because he's you know so athletic as well. Yeah. If 
you know, Thomas is, I don't think that this is necessarily a case for, certainly not the case for every receiver. Thomas is somebody you, again, you want to have a quarterback who can make those throws. Ben had some really good stats on Thomas on our kind of big stealing bananas uh, wide receiver breakdown that made me a little bit more nervous for him. The other element there is that I guess I've gotten pretty excited about Jaden Daniels and think that he it's just always tricky. You go back to all of these different situations where you have, is it the quarterback? Is it the receivers? Sometimes on LSU, it's like, is everybody but Clyde Edwards a lair? <laughs> I try and not focus too much on like the crazy news results, especially in times when it doesn't seem to matter. But am I correct in understanding that the chiefs talked with JK Dobbins and then re-signed CEH? Yes. Because that seems like something that like if you had an infinite number of universes could not have happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The yeah. CH I, just disproved the multiverse. There's only <laughs> one crazy world. Either CH has reinvented himself or uh, <laughs> it is fully over for, uh, for JK Dobbins at this point. Yeah. Um, real quick circling, like on, I know you've done a few of the, the early, uh big board drafts who are your highest drafted uh rookies in that well i got some neighbors today i was excited about that i have a ton of worthy and then once you get a little bit later i have a lot of those running backs that we talked about where i've got a lot of lloyd i've got a decent amount of right i do have an embarrassing about a shipley so when he's like not drafted at all that'll be perfect and then Bowers in a ton of drafts I actually have a pretty decent amount of Sanders. I'm hoping that, I mean, some of these tight ends, I mean, with like Ben Sinnott, you get anything from being the next Sam Laporta to the next Josiah DeGuara, right. which, I mean, if you get the lower end of that, then that would also be crushing. I, I like Ben Sinnott. I He's, one of the reasons I was really on Laporta last year is because he had this interesting profile and the entire way he was projected to go in the second round. Like from the very first time I started looking up who the tight ends of the class were, he was in the mix to go second round and seemed like he had a pretty, pretty good bet the entire way. And then he also was expected to test well, um, which I thought would, would just kind of lock in that draft capital. Senate did test well, but he's been kind of in the, early day three conversation the whole way, which is I just wish I would love for him to get drafted day two. That would be, I think would add a really fun element to the class because he's the guy that jumps out to me. Honestly, maybe it's the tight end two now if Sanders with Sanders athleticism coming in very poor. So uh, I yeah. think they're kind of back to back like in my mind right now, but um if if Sanat, if, if Sanat were to get that draft capital, that, that would be awesome. We actually had him as the tight end, too, in the second edition okay. of the Rookie okay. Guide. I still had uh, Sanders, too. I'm, I'm trying to not let the combine knock me too far off of that. I think he's going to be really good. But I certainly didn't have any problem with us ranking Senate too. Yeah, I have but, him, too, still as well. But it's just much, much closer than it used to be. You know, I you would like to hear – second round and once you start to get that buzz about laporta going that early it was like now you have to get him in every single draft so what you're saying there about the draft capital discourages me you you know you have people like the reason i mentioned Deguara is you got that like very tiny concern that like there could be hybrid roles which mm -hmm. if a team drafts him to not use him as a receiver <laughs> i just you're going to be Furious with are you, are you concerned about that portion of it? There's nothing like looking. I mean, you look at the way he plays and you're like, yeah, he's flexible enough to do everything. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't use him as a receiver. That's where the value is. I mean, his stature doesn't jump out and say, like, this guy should be moved off tight end any more than a lot of the other players. That hadn't been something that I that I was particularly worried about, but honestly, maybe I should be more worried about it. I, I was kind of into Jaheim Bell early on and then realized he was probably an H back. Um, so that <laughs> and so I, I have already had to make that those adjustments. I do also, Pete, have a few of those shares. 
<laughs> the, uh, we just need to get the H back position added, and those that'll pay. We off should, we should add H back. Yeah, think think how powerful. Uh, like, was this are fullbacks eligible? Is Kyle Uchak a, a cheat code? Jeez. Yeah. Um, one thing we've talked about, I, I think it was like a month or so ago, and when Gretch was on, in thinking about players through both the dynasty and the best ball lens, and how sometimes it's a little counterintuitive that you're more willing to take these shots on these guys in best ball um, because you could capture the upside and you don't have to have the like long tail downside risk if they're a bust. Are there any guys, because I know you're high on worthy for both dynasty and best ball. Are there any of these guys that you prefer in one format to the other? Well, I do think that for me, after you get out of the guys who are going to be first round receiver picks in dynasty, I'm actually pretty concerned about that next group so when we get into say you know mcconkey and wilson and coleman leggett um i mean i think that walker probably is the way to play it in both formats and yet because people are out on him it obviously makes you nervous uh, i've got an article that will come out in the next couple of days explaining why i think that you should take that discount. Uh, so if anybody wants some Tez Walker <laughs> hype, you can come to, to Rotoviz to get that. Well, I want some Tez days. Walker hype. No, what I heard is if you want Tez Walker while he's still cheap uh, <laughs> yeah, in, in that's, the next that's two that's days. The <laughs> <laughs> but those guys for me, I, I can understand the profiles and I enjoyed writing up the profiles of these guys and learning about them more and understanding why in kind of the same way for the running backs, why the like full production that you would normally want from these players isn't there and why they could still succeed. And so in best ball, the fact that they could still succeed makes me pretty interested in them in dynasty. It's more a case where I don't think that they necessarily move the needle on your dynasty team for the long term, even if they hit now, again, that's within, within reason. I mean, obviously if they, massively hit then it's going to matter but i would prefer to kind of move to taking some shots if those guys are priced at the same point and they may not end up being but if you can get the some of the top running backs instead of those receivers i would prefer to do it and you know have that be the way i fill out the second round in dynasty i like to take the tight ends in the second and third round in dynasty i'd like i think that it'll be interesting for me because the other piece I'm probably going to have coming out is a piece not necessarily saying that Bo Nix is awesome and you should draft him everywhere and he's going to be an NFL star, but I think that he's misunderstood and that his profile actually would work very well for Minnesota or Denver. And if he lands in one of those places, which I don't think is necessarily super likely, but if he does, I would really like him then. And so I prefer to move to him in dynasty as opposed to those receivers uh, there's there's actually a, a huge split between Knicks and Penix in terms of what uh, at least the SIS stats tell you about those two guys. And it's very dramatic and it's across all of these different elements of quarterback play that people are fixated on. And I think for for a good reason there. So, you know, those are the kind of moves that I would be playing differently in Dynasty, where in Dynasty, I want some of these plays that I think will work and some guys who could hold their value, maybe even go up if they do nothing. Whereas those receivers... If they would hit, they would be meaningful to your best ball team in a certain way that maybe these guys at the other positions still wouldn't be that first year. I like that. I like Knicks too. I, I wasn't really expecting to like Knicks, but writing him up, I was like, he, he avoids mistakes pretty well. He, I mean, he's kind of like, it's similar to, to JJ McCarthy, but you're not getting the upside of like, you know, this tool's a young guy, but you're getting, you know, a guy who's probably ready to start games right now. And, can probably handle a decent amount of passing attempts if he's out there. So um, I'm hoping he goes to Denver. I hope Denver just sits tight and says, if we need a quarterback bad enough to reach for Boba X, so we're doing it. Um, Troy Franklin, I don't think you mentioned. And he's someone that I feel I was very excited about before the combine. Um, and then he comes in super light. He does, he runs four for one. Then he doesn't, he doesn't run at his, uh, his pro day, even though he was heavier and said he was sick at the combine, and that's why he was so skinny, but also he didn't run again, so he's probably just losing weight to get the 40 time down, and it wasn't even that low. But like when you look at the analytical profiles of that of the group, um, kind of 
kind of like past worthy, let's say he stands out. Um, like he's, he really stands out to me in certain ways. It feels, it just feels very boom bust in archetype where it's like this undersized outside wide receiver speedster. Who's not that fast, you know, might be a guy who fits the college game better than the pro game kind of thing. And, and it worries me, but it seems like he's still going to go fairly early round two. Are you still, where, where are you at on him? Yeah. Well, the, you mentioned the physical profile and the comps, like the successful comps that we get to him from that portion are guys like Robbie Anderson and, you know, Didi Westbrook, which I mean, that's not very successful. Mm-hmm. And yet I'm, I, I really like Franklin. So I think he's somebody again, you know, where I'm kind of pushing those guys or pushing him with sort of a Dunze worthy Franklin, I think could be like a, a more tightly grouped, you know, cohort after, after maybe worthy or, you know, obviously put worthy in with those guys. But when you're looking at him and one of the things that I found interesting and in talking to some people who are maybe a little bit more on the, you know, college football side, the maybe a little bit more on the scouting side is that they actually liked him as well so it wasn't just mm. this element and you kind of wonder well i mean it's probably just a couple people then <laughs> because it doesn't seem like he's going to go that early in the draft but i've also heard that maybe he does like sneak into the first round and if he sneaks into the first round then with that profile i mean you're talking about again that first round of super flex even with no running backs is going to actually be very exciting right so you're talking about a, a player who's you know fourth in air yards seventh in yards after the catch he's got that elite yards per route he was fourth in epa per target and this is among the big time prospects from this class and number one in receiver rating. And, you know, so that's the quarterback you know, rating when he's thrown to the guy. Those are a lot of different elements where, I mean, maybe this guy does more. So one of the things too, is that the, you know, you've got a little bit of a build speed element, which I don't know necessarily, especially with a small guy. It, it doesn't, it's something I don't think I would care for. And yet again, the, the scouting guys are saying it's not necessarily a problem in terms of how he gets off and how he wins in a variety of ways and wins early. And so you're like, if you can actually draw all these targets and you've got the production and then once the ball is in your hands, you're pretty good with it. And then you know, you're building speed to potentially some big plays. I mean, yeah, that, that starts to get pretty, <laughs> pretty appealing. And then you just go back to the fact that, you know, he's, he's not as big as you would like, but certainly there are plenty of elements where the NFL game is going in a direction where some of those players are succeeding. It doesn't seem like this year we have quite as many of the film versus metrics battles. I guess the closest would be Lad McConkey. I think like the film guys are pretty hype on him. And yeah, but no analytics know. guys are really stepping up to the plate, including me. I'm just like, fine, <laughs> fine. <laughs> so you're, to, you're, you're saying not to fight it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not really interested in fighting it on Lab McConkey. He's this weird profile where he did what you know he's banged up. He didn't I was gonna fight it. Look, I was gonna fight it, I promise. But then he crushed the combine. And I'm just like, all right, fine. That's that's a metric. I'm on board. Is Lad a fight you're willing to to fight, Sean? <laughs> well, I mean he doesn't play at all, so how do you evaluate? Right? <laughs> yes. Okay, you are yes, willing we got to, a fighter. to have that fight. Tom Sean's gonna carry the I mean, looks mantle. On the plays he was in on, he had some pretty cool numbers. But I mean you, you've got to you've got to play. And so super wide range of outcomes there, right? I think that's yeah. And I and I am happy to make that case. I just with a profile like his, I mean my like baseline thing would be like, what are we doing? But I kind of get what we're doing. He seems pretty well suited to the NFL passing game, big program, very athletic. You're getting, you know, people are really excited about his route running. Um, and when he was out there, he was pretty interesting. So, <laughs> you know, what if he's, what if he's out there now? It could, it could be cool. Yeah, yeah I mean, if he's tra- drafted like 25th overall and stays healthy for three full seasons, the people who wanted to have him were going to be right. Yep. It, it seems like we're headed there. He seems like a back end of round one, tippity top of round two kind of guy just from all of the mock drafts right now. That's very aggressive for a guy who didn't play very much. <laughs> the uh, You mentioned uh, 
Jaden Daniels. I know last year you had a little trepidation around Anthony Richardson as a passer and kind of what that might mean for him. And his ADP obviously got pretty frothy, but it sounds like maybe you're and not saying they're the same player, but maybe similar things that they bring to the fantasy table. You have less concern about Jaden Daniels this time around. Yeah, because there's a, I think there's the potential that he's an elite passer. And so you look at, and again, th- these are two very different guys because one is gigantic and freakishly athletic and the other one is slender. And those are two very different things, but the like evasion numbers. So what you're actually doing as a runner for Daniels were insane is basically Anthony Richardson, but on much higher volume. And then you've got a guy who, as opposed to a, an historically bad passer, and I know Pat has plenty, plenty of rejoinders to that, but instead of that, you get this guy who may be awesome or at least well above average and probably will throw a lot. Whereas, I mean, one of the good, good slash bad things for Richardson is that probably he doesn't throw a ton. And so then it's really just a matter of like how many touchdowns can he score and can he stay healthy? One of the things that, you know, sets me back on Daniels and, and Pat was doing a great job of like crushing my dreams on OT this week where he's talking about like highlight reels of crushing hits for, for Daniels. But you know what? What's that? It does seem bad. Yeah. It's not great. I mean, you, you think about the number of seasons that have been wiped out for players like a Lamar Jackson for a Kyler Murray. Certainly Anthony Richardson has barely played. Uh, It doesn't seem like Trey Lance is good enough to play, but didn't necessarily get a chance to show these guys who, and then there's a, a difference between the players who leave themselves out there to take a lot of hits and those who don't, but even the ones who don't necessarily have suffered injuries that have kept them out and kept you from being able to benefit in fantasy. And yet when you're thinking about Daniels, I guess that I have kind of, and you know, sometimes when you flip on something like this, you end up going down a very bad <laughs> pathway. But I, mean, I kind of think that Daniels is the one guy that you should probably have in a, just a huge, huge percentage of your best ball leagues. Because it, certainly if he goes to a situation where his targets, his weapons around him are not terrible, I think he's going to actually get a lot of passing attempts. And you put those passing attempts and the potential. And one of the things that's kind of interesting when you look at the numbers, obviously, uh, Drake May and Michael Penix were the most willing to throw deep, but especially Penix was really bad at it, which I think puts Adunze's numbers in even a different light when you consider you know, how productive he was. And Adunze was very productive at all three levels. So you know, when you hear about me putting other guys kind of into his direction, it's not because I don't think that he was awesome. He absolutely was. But May, I think, is, is really interesting because you have anything from you know almost Zach Wilson level play to Josh Allen level play. And I think in fantasy, you have to kind of lean into the fact that if you don't, if it's very difficult to project quarterbacks, you want to lean into the quarterbacks who are actually going to give you the value when they do hit. Daniels is somebody who at this point, I think just has an extraordinary potential fantasy profile. And, you know, maybe the coaching and weapons around him will be good enough for that to work. I think it's interesting because you you look at some of the numbers and it's going to be very difficult to evaluate when neighbors and Thomas are so good. Yeah, of course his efficiency numbers and what have you on all these different plays are going to look very good because you had two wide receivers just absolutely crush. But even when you go back and you look at before it completely melted down at Arizona state, I mean, those first two years, the first year, and then this kind of truncated second year, the touchdown interception ratio for Jaden Daniels was fantastic. But I mean, if he can avoid some of the mistakes, he can throw touchdowns if he's going to run, (laughs) <laughs> insanely then yeah i mean I, I think that that is much more appealing the problem that you have for a lot of these players is just that i mean if you get a game and a half then you're gonna need a lot of quarterbacks on that roster to to get through it and so maybe you've got to so i drafted a team today with jane daniels justin fields sam howell in the final round <laughs> I get That's zero points Sean. in week one. Quarterback <laughs> that is so ever Sean. <laughs> You'll pull Sean, that rabbit what? out of your hat somehow, too. <laughs> that, that, you're uh, completely dependent on Jaden Daniels staying healthy. That's, <laughs> you're screwed if he misses two games. Those other two guys are going to win the jobs. I'm telling oh, you right man. now, they're going to win them. 
Are you? Um, oh, you're drafting Justin Fields because I've I'm still not, and I would like to. I would like him to be cheaper, but I feel like I'm not confident he can win the job week one. Uh, but do you, do you think he does? I don't think he's going to win week one. I think he's going to look okay. better in camp. I think that they're going to stick with Geno Smith to see if he can do it. And when he fails with those receiving weapons again, and I say it as somebody who had a ton of Smith the year before. I Wait, think are you talking about last year. Sam Howell, but, Pat, or were you talking about Fields? Well, I'm curious. I mean, if he thinks uh, – I'm, I'm interested in both, so. Oh, sorry. So, yes, Howell's going to win eventually. Justin Fields is going to win from day one. I mean, okay, the okay. gap between Russell Wilson and Justin Fields in 2024 is like the gap between Russell Wilson and me. I mean, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't understand that one. And so, yeah, I mean, obviously, teams do crazy stuff all the time. I'm wrong all the time. You put those two things together, and probably Justin Fields doesn't play a snap while you're long. But now that you've got that discount, I don't know. I Yeah. I'm going to still draft Justin Fields. On on the Jaden Daniels stuff and Drake May, how different do you view the Commanders and Patriots landing spots? Because that is talked about a lot, where some people are like, man, I really hope the guy I like goes to the Commanders and not the Patriots. Do you view that that gap as well? I do. And I, I think there's a level below which – it's virtually impossible to succeed. I actually think that Mac Jones is somebody that teams should have gone out and tried to get mm. and like give a shot to. I mean, he would be like one of, you know, two or three options that you looked at, but I mean, you, you go back and, and look at Mac Jones and what he was able to do sometimes in the past, even his first year with the Patriots, he got into a situation that there was going to be no possible way to succeed and actually tried to keep, you know, pushing things and made mistakes and so then they're like well we'll just go to a guy who's going to throw it two yards and isn't going to yell at the coaches which you know <laughs> i've done some very different types of coaching and there is a point at which you're like yeah i mean we're going to lose anyway let's play the guy who's not going to yell at me <laughs> so i can understand that but i mean it's a problem when you get to be that bad and the patriots i think are that bad i also do think though that at some point it could flip because i think there's a potential for the patriots coaching situation to be better than the commander's coaching situation so you get a little bit deeper into it, and I think maybe New England could be better. Certainly, I don't think either one is great. I mean, Jahan Dotson was awful last year, and he didn't have a great profile coming in. It's certainly better than a lot of these guys who are still going fairly early. So I don't think we can come, like say he was like a terrible prospect. And having just made the case for Sam Howell, I think there's a possibility that that was Sam Howell's fault. Right. But also think, you know, Washington is not loaded either. On the on the Drake May, Jay and Daniel stuff, I I just Sean, I want you to come over here to the Drake May's got the super exciting fantasy profile. Uh that it's I know Jaden Daniels has a more obvious fantasy profile, and you know, there's just no no question about that. He's his ability to to be a between the twenties runner is is gonna be really, really, really strong. But I just pulled up uh, big time deep throws, so twenty plus yard throws charted as big time throws by PFF per per career drop back, and Justin Fields five point seven percent, Sam Howell five point six percent. In between those two, the two guys you just built a best ball team around, right in between that, Drake May five point seven percent. This dude throws downfield. He's, I think, you know, the consistency, the overall quality. Right. Those are question marks, but he is going to be out there trying to make plays. And I think if he fails, he's going to go down swinging. And then the other thing is that he's, I mean, compared to Howell, he avoids taking sacks fairly well. He's right around Caleb Williams in pressure to sack rate. And then he's going to run for touchdowns at, at a decent rate where he's not going to give you the same rushing production that Jaden Daniels does. But I wonder if there's as big a gap as people assume because, one, he's going to run for touchdowns. He's a, he's a fairly big guy. And, two, he is a scrambler. He had a kept clean, clean scramble rate of 7%. That was just below uh, Justin Fields at 8%. It was tied with Malik Willis. Like This, was, this guy is willing to run. Jane Daniels is 9.4%, so he's also a very willing runner. But I just think like the – gap between the two is somewhat overstated even as a rusher because design running game sure but 
but as a scrambler and a guy who's being asked to make plays around the goal line, I think we're going to get a decent amount of production from May on the ground. And then I feel more confident in May's deep passing. You just didn't really see much from Daniels as a deep passer heading into 2023. And then he plays with Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas, and he and he goes nuts as a deep passer. I am concerned that that those that part of his game specifically was propped up by two first round wide receivers, one elite prospect. That would be my concern and why I'm pretty firmly over on the Drake May side of that. Well, one of the things that you did the other day was convince me that I mean I'm moving these guys ahead of Anthony Richardson for one. And I think that the upside there is extreme. And so that part has me because of, because of the way that I do like to play QB and dynasty, I do have some teams where I have early picks and I need to make a quarterback pick. And so it's this balance between thinking that neighbors could be the next Jamar chase basically. And then you have to decide whether you want to take the swing on quarterbacks who have such a, a massive, massive range of outcomes or do what you can do of picking up a Derek Carr and, and Baker Mayfield and knowing you're going to yeah. give up points, but filling your roster out and saying, I'm going to not miss early. And I'm also going to make up points. If not this year, then over the course of the next decade with someone like neighbors. So that part is difficult for me, but I do think that, the element there on May is completely correct. And I also have a little bit of maybe an optimism that maybe he's less likely than all of these other guys to get hurt. And that part would, I mean, if you could just stay healthy and do those things, it would be a huge deal. Do you have any concern about the price? Number one, the fact that the next season is going to be most important to most people. And then the you know trade valuations and what you can do going forward. To me, May feels a little bit more like a Josh Allen just overall, which is awesome. But from the perspective of, I guess I'm pretty scared that the 2024 season is not when it's going to happen. Or that there's, a, that, that as you kind of think about the different probabilities, that you have a very reasonable scenario where it doesn't happen in 2024, maybe it doesn't even happen in 2025, but he's so clearly talented and is going to be the future that they stick with him. And in 2026, he's just tearing the world apart. Or is that kind of getting into things that, I mean, quarterback projection is already so difficult that thinking that that portion of it we could even, you know, give the, the probabilities to is maybe too much. Well, I mean, if he goes to the Patriots, I think the odds of that definitely climb. And I, de- I, I, I could definitely see that being the case. I hope it's not the case. I have a lot of him in best ball, but he's so cheap in best ball that I maybe survive it, <laughs> even if, you know, he doesn't do much for me except a few spike weeks down the stretch or something. Just Justin Fields as your backup. You'll be all fine. He <laughs> oh might sell me on Fields. I, I really want that to happen. So uh, I'm almost there. But yeah, no, I definitely could see that playing out. I think with Drake May, I'm very excited about him in Dynasty. It reminds me of Richardson last year where I started to feel very strongly like, oh, you guys don't know what this dude is like he like Richardson is a tank. He runs the ball and he's a decent deep thrower and he doesn't take sacks. So he's going to be, he's going to be able to be out there and create plays in an actual NFL offense. He's also going to do all the stuff everyone's saying about how inaccurate he is, is a hundred percent true. And no one's going to care in like three months. Which is I think that exactly there's a chance happened. that they were going to have trouble actually running their offense, that that was going to show maybe, up as maybe, the games went on. I mean, Sam maybe. Howell was leading the NFL in passing yards for a big chunk. And then when Pat I mean, says no was, one was going to care, he doesn't mean the Colts organization. He means fantasy players. I mean, fantasy managers. Up the, yeah. The sure, and, sure. You're, and you're not but benching at a first certain round point. Kid. I guess I do think at a certain point that, uh, I mean, we, we've probably talked about Justin Fields much more than he deserves, but this is a player <laughs> who does a lot of things that are so extraordinary and also does some things that help you specifically in the current NFL, but he also has some weaknesses that are so dramatic that, you know, certain analysts are going to say he's terrible. And we just got like 32 NFL teams <laughs> say that he's terrible. So, I mean, it, 
but you can say that that's that's down the line because I think it's obviously the, the team I mean, that drafts either Richardson or May is going to let them play out for a while before that happens. Exactly. You know, I think Richardson. You should be. I, I in in my article on the quarterbacks, I included a a trade to get from Richardson to Burrow. You know that kind of thing. Like, hey, take this. It's you know he hasn't gained a ton of value, but he has gained value. Since his rookie season, a season where he barely played and got hurt, he's gained Isn't value. Is there the possibility, though, that the injury really helped him? Maybe, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe I got bailed out by the injury. But I do – I think in another guy that, that I would compare May to, and this is actually more of a, a true comp, is Herbert, where I think people are going to go, okay, this dude's got a big arm. He's willing to make plays. He's big. He runs around. This is fun. I'm into this. I think uh, another guy that we, you know, this isn't going to seem that fun, but it kind of was fun for a minute. Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones was kind of like, oh, why would we ever want Daniel Jones? This guy sucks. And then he got out there and he ran around and it was like, oh, he scores fantasy points. That's cool. I like those. So, yeah, I mean, like Richardson is like, you should be exploring trade avenues off of Richardson now because the bet has changed a little bit. It's now a second season that he's going to get, you know, if he gets hurt again, he's going to be injury prone. He's going to be graded on a different curve because he's not a rookie, but Drake may, I think he's going to come out and people are just going to be like, why did I care about this dude's footwork? What does that matter for me? And they're going to be excited about his big arm, his mobility and his playmaking desire. And all of a sudden they're going to go, I want this guy on my team that I, I will pay you, you know, 150% of what you just paid, you know, three months ago. So I think, well, I, and I personally, I think, I think he's going to succeed. So I don't even think it's just a play for value gain, but I think that value gain is going to be there for you. And I think that there's a potential. So number one, you're, you're going to sell us to that. He's just much, much better than Will Levis because there were some arguments along those lines for him and like all of our college football people are like Levis can't play at all I mean he's just he cannot play and that's not the case here the thing that's kind of interesting when, when I was looking at the 20 plus passes to try and calibrate myself on like these kind of six main prospects the fact that Dre that May throws down the field is encouraging I mean Penix also did a lot but extremely ineffectively some of the numbers for May on those 20 plus passes are not particularly good. But the other thing there, as I'm looking at them, is to try to remind myself that this guy is younger than a bunch of the guys he's being compared to, and he's surrounded by weaker teammates than the people he's being compared to. And those things also matter as we're thinking about, again, just how hard it is to predict quarterbacks and the ultimate upside that this player has. Yeah, I think that his youth and and upside is is definitely part of it as well. The other thing, and I think the well Will Levis, uh, you know, comparison is important, and and one of the reasons that I, I'm excited about May is that like going back and listening to some of the stuff from the summer, you know, and, and like Connor Rogers and and Trevor Sikama's pod, I, I really like. They were, you know, it's it's Caleb Williams and Drake May heading into the season. These are the guys. These are clearly the guys. You, you listen to the athletic football show. They're talking about uh, around, I think in November, Dane Brugler was, was thinking about having May as his quarterback one. He eventually goes back to Williams. Nate Tice had May as his quarterback one for a while. I don't know if he still does. Um, the May is not, in fact, Daniels is the guy who was kind of not in the mix. And then all of a sudden after a final season, become like you know bolts up from intriguing developmental guy to you know maybe the number two pick in the draft may has been here despite being the young guy may has been here the entire way as far as i can tell and so yeah i don't think he doesn't feel like a product of the draft process in any way this feels very much driven by his uh his college football resume which i think is very important I've gotten a little bit concerned. I mean, you mentioned people having May at number one, and I'm I'm concerned that Caleb Williams is going to need to have a huge number of passing attempts as a professional to be the type of fantasy quarterback that matches these other two guys that they hit. So that's another wrinkle as people are trying to decide the 101, trying to decide whether or not to trade down, trying to decide how to draft in best ball. 
Sean, when I you mentioned the what? multiverse, I would be just in love with the idea of an article if we got six or seven different Sean's and every Sean thought there should be a different 101 this year. Because that's <laughs> that's the vibe I'm getting that you you could make exceptional cases for at least five, maybe seven different 101s this season. The I'm glad you brought that up, Sean, because I have in one of my super flex leagues, it isn't a tight end premium, but I have I have the 103. And I think I would legit be disappointed if the two receivers went off the board and I had to take Caleb Williams. Partly is because I'm already okay at quarterback and partly because I want one of neighbors and Harrison. I, I just give me one of them. I don't care. I will be devastated if I don't get one of those. And it makes me think like, yes, I I'm just a, a wide receiver uh, piss boy, you know, and I like my wide receivers, but two, I'm like, aren't these the two best players for fantasy that we want in this class is Caleb Williams. Are you, are you just buying the longevity or is he really going to separate at the position in a way that makes him the clear cut one-on-one? Yeah, it's, it's tough because it, I just need it to move from the situation where you can play any player in the super flex position, which you obviously can, to where you can also play those players in the QB1 position, and then we're all set. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. You want double super flex. Double super flex. No okay. quarterback. Wow. Is, well, you guys were able to will in the uh, the road of his triflex leagues with FFPC. Maybe you could make Quasi. that happen. The next the next wrinkle in the format. Um, well, Sean, this was a uh, this is a blast getting to chop it up with you. And I know you did some shows with Pat this week. If people want to check out more of this conversation, you guys have the great uh, road of his rookie guide. Uh, I've been enjoying that. Yours and uh, JJ's have been two of my go to PDFs on my desktop as I uh, think through all these prospects. Um, but yeah, any, anything else that people should look out for on the horizon at Rotoviz? Well, yeah, thank you for mentioning the Rotoviz rookie guide. We'll have volume three right after the draft. Had a lot of fun putting that together and a lot of these notes from SIS that we've discussed today will be in there along with obviously plenty of other things. I mentioned the Knicks article. I mentioned the Tez Walker article. Uh, have been very lucky in the recent results in the FFPC Superflex tournament and going to have a piece on how you beat that. Our roster construction explorer has been a huge help in putting together teams for that. And then have two or three. I've been a little bit light on the content in the last month as I've been doing a lot of research, but I'm about to have an absolute flood of rookie content coming out on the site as well. Yeah, really looking forward to this uh, this next month. It's going to be a lot of fun. Awesome. Pat, uh, what about you? I know you guys had a... ADP chasing over on the leg up feed uh, today. Anything else from you before you go on paternity leave? That was a good one. I would recommend checking that out. We uh, there was some there was some shouting. There were some lies. <laughs> That's some wow. amazing. Yeah, Davis at one point goes, "Well, obviously, I'm lying about this a little bit." <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Davis had a little asterisk under everything Davis says. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was a, it was a good one. Um, yeah, I've got rookie content rolling out. So, um, uh, yeah, mentioned the wide receiver piece, uh, earlier today also had my first running back piece out this week, working on a second running back piece, more wide receivers and the tight ends. I've already written up the quarterback. So if you're curious about, um, you know, all, all the Drake may Jaden Daniels takes, I would, someone asked in the comments if I would take may over Caleb Williams, I'm still taking Williams number one, but, um, still, you know, very excited about May, but you can read about that over on, on leg up as well. Um, and yeah, we're, we're planning on having some stuff uh, rolling out on the site while I'm gone. And then I'll be back on chip chasing for the NFL draft. That's right. Uh, for me, I mentioned, I did do the uh, dream running back landing spots uh, article for fantasy life. That'll go up on the site tomorrow. If you want to check that out with those predicted ADPs. And I also dropped a video over on the Deposit Kingdom channel. I reviewed my biggest board draft. I did a slow draft and went kind of pick by pick uh, through there. Pat would be proud to know that I uh, stacked up Lamar Jackson with Mark Andrews on yeah. that team. And you can go and get my thoughts on all those picks. Just messing around with different formats over there on the Deposit Kingdom channel. So I'd appreciate it if you checked it out. Give me some feedback on what you guys like, what you'd like to see more of. 
Uh, otherwise, thank you all to the chat for hanging out tonight. Thank you to producer Nick in the hopper helping us out. And uh, yeah, go get your Devontae Walker before he gets more expensive. We'll see you guys <laughs> next week on Ship Chasing. <laughs>